the floor back to Michael. Just one quick uh, announcement. I want to try changing up the protocol a little bit when people ask questions. So keep all the questions coming. The discussion is wonderful. Just if you have a question, if you wouldn't mind pausing for like two seconds, I'm going to run over to, to you with the microphone. So just, just pause for like one or two seconds, and I'll give you the mic, and I think it'll help both for capturing and for everyone else hearing. Um, if you forget, we'll deal with it, but try to just pause for like two seconds. All right, that's it. Thank you. All right. Um, good. good. Uh, so welcome back. Welcome back. Mm. Uh, does anyone have a solution to the puzzle? Uh, wait. Uh, uh, <laughs> you, you, told me, you told me that there are some hand gestures that I'm supposed to know. This is not in the dictionary. <laughs> okay. All right, all right. Uh, let me. I, I will not give you the solution, actually. But, uh, let, let, let me remind you what the puzzle was. We can discuss with you after we talk. Whoa, wait, what? Uh, okay. Uh, it's a crisis. Ah, I see. It's turned off. Should, should I say? All right, that? no. Huh? Do you have the solution? I mean, can you not just form the outer product and that's kind of like tossing it into D squared bins and then you can just check every one of those bins, or is that not working? Mm, doesn't okay. Uh, doesn't qualify as fast somehow. Oh, I see. Now this is the outer product. This yeah, makes that sense. Was I should have guessed. That was, right. that, was, that, was, that was the hand gesture for. Okay. <laughs> 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 um, I see. I see. Uh, well, maybe, maybe, but can, yeah, it's F of T. Oh. Right. You, you can. You, the, the, the solution is F of T. Uh, you can do a, It's a convolution. Yeah. What you need to do is convolve uh, convolve count sketch one and count sketch two. So you can do this uh, maybe in some quadratic way. So maybe this seems quadratic, <laughs> right? But you can also do a convolution. What's the hand signal for FFT? Uh, I, yeah, okay. I wouldn't know. <laughs> okay, uh, good. Um, uh, good. So this, by the way, is a beautiful. Uh, this is a beautiful idea of uh, Palm and uh, Pay. So Rasmus Pay and uh, uh, and Palm. This is known as Tensor Sketch. Uh, we will get back to it. Uh, just sketch an al uh, application for this uh, formulation. All right, I couldn't pause. <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay, so the uh, the uh, the question was uh, whether we have applications uh, for this uh, for this sketch, right? So let me first say yes. I guess somehow uh, I'm thinking. No, uh, you have. For example, maybe you have some. Uh, Maybe these XIs encode some events that happen. I'm just making up an application, which yeah, I think is nice. Uh, maybe the XIs are like counts for how many times something happens. Just it's a vector of variables, yeah. random variables, and you want to know uh, the most correlated ones. I see. Uh, right, the correlated pairs. Yeah. Uh, and you want to just compress your variables, uh, not the pairs. And then you find the most correlated pairs somehow. Uh, we'll get back to this in the context of kernel methods. We'll, we'll do linear algebra in this hour. Uh, and uh, one application will be uh, if you're trying to solve, say, kernel ridge regression, where you have a bunch of data points and uh, you are uh, you're forming a kernel matrix on them, and the kernel is the polynomial kernel. That's what you do. Uh, right, uh, we will learn how to solve this uh, kernel ridge regression using techniques basically of this nature. Yeah. We will use this particular solution. Great, uh, great, great question. Good. Okay, uh, good. So the answer is uh, FFT, and uh, we will uh, uh, we'll spell out uh, the convolution in more detail later. So I will not dwell on it now. It remains a puzzle for a while. Uh, uh, good. So now coming back to a question that was asked uh, before about uh, the Typical distribution of XIs, uh, right? In real life, what do the vectors that we uh, want to take top k elements off look like? Uh, so, as we mentioned, this is the guarantee that count sketch gives, and it gives it for worst case x. Mm. There is a really cool result of Minton and Price from uh, Soda 14, which shows the following: that if x actually is drawn from some distribution, and it's a nice distribution like Powell or Cyprian, uh, then the uh, precision of count sketch itself is significantly better. And th this is a nice result where uh, you know, the authors give a very refined analysis of uh, the error estimates. It's not just a basic 
uh, median taking and variances that we uh, do, but uh, it's, it's, it's beautiful. Uh, the SOTA 14 paper assumes purely independent hashing. So for the analysis that I gave, uh, two-wise dependence is enough. Uh, the SOTA 14 paper assumes purely independent hashing, so that was a deficiency. A very recent work, I guess it's the upcoming work uh, uh, of Pranit uh, Kachan, uh, Rasmus Pei, Mikhail Thorak, and David Woodruff, uh, gives a, a pseudorandom generator that can be used to remove the assumption of purely independent hashing from the Minton Price work. So it's an active area. Very cool. Okay. Uh, one interesting, one question that I find very interesting is the uh, measurement complexity of count sketch that uh, I stated was optimal asymptotically, uh, right? But uh, can we get non asymptotic bounds? Mm, in particular, note that works on sparse recovery that go through the L1 minimization round, uh, route, they're non sublinear, uh, they actually get very good constants. Uh, whereas if we were to make count sketch sublinear time decodable, uh, the constants would not be that great. Uh, for example, uh, I didn't cover how you decode it in sublinear time, uh, but uh, roughly the way you do this is you, well, if you set up a data structure, you take your K, your universe, you hash into 10K buckets, uh, and then you look at the buckets, you know by some basic Markov bound that most of your top K elements will be isolated in the buckets. And for those isolated people, you can figure out what they are and you can get good estimates of them. Then you can subtract by linearity of the sketch and you can recurse on what remains. So what remains, you hash into more buckets, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, okay, so that at some basic level reminds me uh, of uh, constructions of LDPC codes where it is very important that the TANA graph, which is this bipartite graph that uh, tells us which element contributes to which bucket, so to speak. If we were to achieve capacity, the TANA graph actually should not be regular. And these TANA graphs are very carefully optimized uh, to achieve capacity and the peeling decoders uh, well, don't lose constants. I wonder if uh, something like this can be done for uh, count sketch related um, questions. There, there are some very nice recent works that go in this direction, so for example, uh, uh, a soda paper of Stefan Walzer uh, on uh, uh, peeling close to the orientability threshold. So this is getting uh, good constants. Very cool paper on simple set sketching by Rasmus Pei, Stefan Walzer, and uh, Cothers and Sosa this year. Uh, doesn't get optimal bounds, uh, but it gets very nice constants as it happens to be simple. Okay. Is there any link to, in this field, to uh, compressive sensing? Oh, good. Uh, yes, uh, definitely. Um, good. So the L1 minimization that I mentioned is compressive sensing. Uh, the, uh, the results that we obtained are also compressive sensing. Uh, the count sketch results, the ones I mentioned, L infinity to L2, sparse recovery guarantee, that is compressive sensing. Mm. Period. Yes. What does L... What does L1 minimization mean? Oh, good. Uh, L1 minimization is uh, uh, basically a technique uh, pioneered by Candace and Tao for uh, sparse recovery compressed sensing. The question is basically the following. Uh, you have a vector x. It is approximately sparse. You want to recover it from uh, linear measurements, from some a times x. Uh, all right. And uh, how you do this is you take your a times x. You, have, you know the right-hand side. And basically what you would like to do is try all the sparse vectors and check which one fits your measurements the best, but that's hard. You don't know how to optimize over sparse vectors. Instead, what you do is you uh, add a minimizer, add an objective function uh, to add a term to your objective function that asks to minimize the L1 norm uh, of your vector as opposed to L0, which is the number of non zeros. This becomes tractable. Uh, and get, gets nice constants, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. It's very interesting to uh, uh, sort of get the best of both worlds. We have techniques that are sublinear time that don't require the solution of a big linear system. So here, uh, to, uh, to find the solution, you solve an LP. Uh, and in particular, the entire universe is involved. It's very expensive. Uh, but it would be very cool to, uh, to do both. All right. 
I think I, I think I know what you mean. I, I was debating, what, what? debating about the expensiveness of, of solving sometimes the other problems. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's just yeah. Yeah. Can you at some point, not necessarily now, but uh, it, it, you're saying that you would be nice to get some some kind of Can you state sort of a formal version of, uh -huh. of that at some point? Good. Uh, let me state it right now. Uh, uh, I want a sublinear time uh, sparse recovery primitive uh, that uh, has very good uh, constants in the measurement complexity. Uh, or anything hybrid, a you know, weaker objective. Take L1 minimization, uh, which requires the solution of a linear system. Uh, linear program. Uh, linear, pro linear program, yes. But, uh, maybe marry it a little bit with uh, sparse recovery, uh, with, with these randomized hashing techniques. And, and to clarify when you're saying, when you say expensive, you mean just like not sublinear? Like yes, a, exactly. Expensive is not sublinear, but it's expensive in practice sometimes. Like the universe is big. Yeah. More questions? Or, or here? Uh, yeah. I guess in the in the compressive sensing world, they sometimes assume a distribution of the inputs. Right. I mean, if you if you if you, it's it, it, they probably make an assumption that's akin to, but maybe stronger than your assumption that the k heavy hitters uh, amount to a significant fraction. I mean, if you significantly strengthened uh, that assumption, maybe you could get away with because they have methods for avoiding linear programming or, or you know full full strength linear programming. They use uh, simpler methods that work only under an assumption about the input. So hmm. that might be an interesting direction. No, yeah, I, I don't actually know which ones you mean here. That, that sounds interesting. Maybe, I'll, maybe, I'll try maybe. to find let's, a let's, reference. Let's talk more. It's been let's years. Let's talk more. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a good question. Okay, great. Um, <laughs> uh, so a couple, uh, a couple of other notes uh, on, uh, on, on sound sketch. One important thing to note is that the, uh, the techniques that we, ah, yeah, so first, uh, of course, uh, we were choosing the hash function uniformly at random and the sine function uniformly at random, but it is possible to learn them. So there's a whole field of uh, learning augmented um, uh, sketching and learning augmented algorithm design. Uh, do come to our workshop uh, later in the program to find out uh, the details, uh, right? Another important thing to note is that the analysis that we have seen is very much not adversarially robust. So the way this works is we fix the stream up front, we fix the queries up front, and then we argue that with high probability over the, um, over the randomness of the data structure, the estimates will be good. Uh, what happens if the input is chosen by an adversary that has partial knowledge of the uh, data structure? Right. Uh, so that's, uh, there has been a lot of exciting work on this. Uh, this is the adversarially robust uh, sketching world. Again, uh, come to the workshop to learn uh, a lot more on this. Mm. One should note that in general, these are hashing-based data structures. So it feels like an adversary, if, it, if the adversary knows the hashing, the adversary can force a collision and uh, it will, it's definitely very non-trivial, but there are methods, yes. So when you say he has partial knowledge, does that mean he just knows the answer to some queries or any other kind of? Good. Uh, I, I was purposefully vague. Uh, by partial knowledge, I mean that uh, the ad generally I mean that the adversary has been interacting with the data structure, right? I so the adversary, yeah, has, has seen some answers based on the previous answers, decides the next, next query, etc. Yeah. 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 Yes. Exactly. Uh, good. Uh, so there are exciting works on this. So, for, for instance, a very nice recent work of uh, uh, Edith Koench and uh, Lou, uh, Jino, Jino, uh, Nelson uh, Sarawash and uh, others on the uh, robustness, on making count sketch robust to adaptive uh, inputs. Okay. Good. Um, okay. Uh, fantastic. So we have seen count sketch. Mm. Before we move on to applications of uh, count sketch and uh, various dimensionality reduction techniques uh, in linear algebra, uh, let's uh, pause for a second and look at the count sketch matrix and note some interesting facts about it. 
so here's what the count sketch matrix looks like. Remember that uh, we're talking about sketching, right? So uh, we're acting on our input, which is a vector x. In the heavy hitters example, it's the frequency vector by a matrix on the left. So what does this count sketch matrix look, look like? So here is uh, roughly what it looks like. The property is that um, it's a hashing matrix with random signs. So every column of this matrix contains exactly one non-zero. And it has a plus one or a minus one, right? So every... Uh, um, um, uh, that's when you hash into just v buckets once. Count sketch, of course, repeats this many times, but that's just one repetition. All right, uh, if you look at a given row, well, the non zeros are in the places that correspond to items that hash to that bucket. Well, wonderful. So, in general, we, we put random plus minus ones or Gaussians, uh, if we like, on random subsets of the universe. Note that applying the count sketch matrix to a vector is really fast because there is exactly one non-zero in every column. You can compute S times X for any X in time proportional to the number of non-zeros in X. It's very efficient. Uh, this will be useful uh, later. Okay, so this is just to point out that rows non-zeros correspond to buckets. Um, all right. So here, see, CountScape does random restrictions and then puts random signs uh, on the non-zero places. What if we don't do random signs? What if we just look at a matrix that takes dot products of the input vector with random subsets of the universe without doing random signs? What do we learn from the distribution of from S times X for this matrix? Uh, the answer is that we can learn the L0 norm of the input. Uh, the number of non-zeros. So that's how distinct elements sketches that approximate the number of distinct elements in a stream work. All right. And really what you do is, uh, so here, for example, I have uh, a matrix where the first row cont contains a very sparse sample of the universe. It's just two ones in random locations. The next row contains three ones, the next one is five ones, et cetera, et cetera. So they get denser. So of course, if you have uh, X that has a certain number of non-zeros, you observe this matrix times x, and then we just check which row is non-zero, and this gives you information about how many non-zeros you had. Uh, good. Um, all right, what if you don't do random restrictions and just put random signs everywhere? Then you get the Johnson Lindon Strauss uh, transform. Instead of random signs, you could also put uh, Gaussians of appropriate variance. But for example, if, you, if your sketching matrix is just a single row of IAD Gaussians, then it preserves uh, the L2 squared norm of your vector in expectation by the L2 stability of Gaussians. If you take M rows of IAD Gaussians of appropriately scaled down variance, then this will actually preserve L2, norm, L2 norms with high probability and high is uh, mm, sort of exponentially high in the number of rows. Okay, uh, so such matrices though have the downside uh, and the downside is that uh, it's difficult, to, computationally expensive to compute S times X. Um, one other thing that I would like to note is that the johnson lindon strauss transform itself can be sped up, for example, by using the uh, Hadamard transform. Uh, so something known as the subsampled Hadamard transform is a sketching matrix uh, that also lets us approximate uh, Euclidean norm of the input vector. The matrix is ni nicely factorizable as P times H times D, where D is the diagonal random sign matrix, H is the Hadamard transform, and P is just a sampling matrix. The statement here is that if you take any vector, you randomize the signs, and then take the Hadamard transform, the energy of the resulting vector is pretty equally spread across coordinates. So if you want to approximate it, you might as well just sample it in a few places. Okay. Uh, the advantage is, of course, that S times X can be computed fast using the fast Fourier transform, fast Hadamard transform. Okay. Uh, this does not come uh, close to the NNZ of X time, though. Right, so this, if the input is sparse, there's no advantage. Okay, uh, good. So uh, another related point is the frequency moments, the question. So we have uh, seen the johnson lindon strauss transform that approximates the L2 squared norm of a vector, uh, which is 
if the vector is the frequency vector of a stream, then that's just the sum of squared uh, frequencies. Uh, this is known as the second frequency moment. Um, if we instead do random restrictions but not do random signs, then we learn the L0 norm of the vector, the number of null zeros. And in general, one can ask this uh, question. This was asked by Alon, Matthias, and Zegedi. What is the complexity, the space complexity of approximating the pth frequency moment in a data stream? And it turns out that for any p between 0 and 2, we have seen 0 and 2, the endpoints, one can approximate in polylogarithmic space. p larger than that requires uh, a polynomial amount of space and the size of the universe. And this, of course, has led to amazing uh, lower bound techniques. For example, the optimal bound is from Bar Yosef and others, this information the theory, uh, information complexity approach to data streaming lower bounds. Okay. Uh, good. So that's all I wanted to say about the uh, classical applications to data streaming. So let me now move uh, to linear algebra. Okay. Excellent. Uh, so, so we switch gears and uh, we ask ourselves the following question. Suppose that I'm given n high dimensional data points, uh, a1, a2 through an, so they live in Rd, uh, and uh, a bunch of values bj. You should think of these values as the evaluation of some function on these data points. Okay, so here's a not very high dimensional uh, example. Uh, here, uh, this is one dimensional, or actually two dimensional, because every point is uh, augmented with a constant term, uh, right? Uh, I have a bunch of points and measurements of some function, and I want to find a good least squares fit. So that's the linear regression problem. Um, formally, the least squares problem is, I want to minimize uh, the sum of squared deviations of my linear function, the coefficients are given by x, uh, on the samples aj, and uh, the true values, the ones that I want to fit, are bj. Good. I might want to also regularize the problem uh, by adding an L2 squared constraint with some parameter lambda. So that's a regularization term. So, so didn't you miss an index j with x or sort of these squares problem? Ah, uh, good question. I did not. Okay. So Mikkel's question was whether I missed an index j with x, and oh. I mean it because I'm thinking that the AJs are row vectors yeah. of length D, and this is the dot product. Oh. So if I missed anything, then this would be the dot. Uh, no, they're row vectors, no transpose. <laughs> and says, okay, and X is a column vector. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here, here's a confirmation. Okay, so the, the AJs are rows of a matrix A, and x is a column vector, so aj times x is just the dot product. Excellent. Okay, so think of n, of the number of rows in this matrix, as being very big and much bigger than d, the dimensionality of uh, our vectors. This is the big data regime. Imagine you have lots of noisy samples, and you want to solve this fast. Any questions about the setting? It's good. So over-constrained. Uh, least squares regression, maybe with a regularization term. Good. So some amount of linear algebra uh, tells us that the solution is this. All right. So some, some kind of inverse of A transpose A, appropriately regularized, times A, A, A transpose B. Uh, so if we were to solve this naively uh, with classical techniques, uh, then this would be n times d squared time, linear in the large dimension and quadratic in the small. Maybe we can do a bit faster with fast matrix multiplication, but this is not uh, our concern here. What we would like to do instead is, is get a linear, nearly linear time algorithm in the size of A, assuming that the size of A is significantly bigger than, uh, bigger than poly D. So I'm interested in an algorithm that has size of A plus poly D and maybe some precision. Good. So I don't know how to do this exactly. So I will be shooting for approximate solutions to the least squares uh, problem. 
what's an approximate solution to a least squares uh, problem? I will want to one plus epsilon approximate the objective value. So basically, it's a one plus epsilon approximate quality of fit. Right. One could ask to find a solution x prime that is coefficients x prime that are close to x star, but that's not really possible. My matrix could be ill-conditioned. It's, it's difficult and uh, maybe even not so interesting. So instead, I just want some x prime such that the quality of fit under x prime is pretty much the same as the uh, quality of fit under the optimal x star. Excellent. Now, uh, given that this is a sketching talk, mm, the way I will achieve the goal is by designing a sketch that reduces the number of rows in A to something manageable. So we'll want to squish the matrix A to something with polynomial in D and this precision parameter epsilon, a number of rows. Oh, similarly, of course, we need to squish B. Uh, and then we'll get a smaller problem. Uh, we'll solve it exactly using classical techniques and poly D, something like that, time, and it will be great. Okay. So what we want to make sure, though, is that uh, this squishing of the, of the problem uh, needs to happen in time linear to uh, linear in the size of A. Okay. So that's the idea. Basically, I'll design some sketching matrix A and the sketching matrix will just be the count sketch matrix. Um, instead of solving AX minus B L2 norm squared plus a lambda um, equality in norm of X, I'll just exactly solve the dimensionality reduced problem. Here's a, a pictorial representation of this. This is my sketching matrix. It reduces M to something manageable. So note that the ultimate number of rows will be, well, will be bigger than D. It'll be D squared or so. So that's the reduced problem. Okay, any questions about the uh, setup and uh, what we want to achieve? Uh -huh. The size you mean is zero or dimension? When you say the linear size. Oh, great. So the question was, <laughs> the question was, um, when I say linear in the size of the matrix A, runtime, what do I mean? Do I mean n times d? Or do I mean the number of non-zeros? I mean the number of non-zeros. Yeah, great, great. So quick question. So how, what should I think of a lambda? Because if lambda is large, the matrix is well conditioned, and I could just use some iterative methods, right? Excellent. Um, the question was, what should I think of lambda? For now, think of lambda as zero. Okay. Uh, and okay. later, uh, we'll see what to do with the general lambda. For large lambdas, the problem will indeed be, get easier. Yeah, great point. All right, uh, good. So this is uh, our goal. Uh, fantastic. So we want some kind of a dimensionality reduction primitive that can squish Mm, linear regression problems. So what properties of a sketching matrix S would suffice for this purpose? So I claim that the answer to this is the following. Uh, let me define the notion of subspace embeddings. What's a subspace embedding? A random matrix S, think the count sketch matrix, is a D epsilon delta subspace embedding if the following is true. Let's fix our favorite subspace P in this n-dimensional Euclidean space. Fix, think of your favorite subspace P. It's a subspace of dimension D. S is a subspace embedding if the following is true. Think of your subspace. You flip the coins to determine the sketching matrix S. And then you look at every vector Y in your subspace to measure its Euclidean norm, then you squish it down using your sketch and measure the Euclidean norm of the squished vector. These have to be the same for all vectors y, simultaneously. 
So subspace embedding is a random matrix that with high probability approximately preserves the geometry of any given subspace. I think this is kind of related to Johnson Linden's transforms. In the JL, uh, in the JL lemma, you basically take, you want to preserve distances between points, and this amounts to preserving lengths of vectors that are differences between points. So the JL, uh, Johnson Linden Strauss is basically sort of a one dimensional subspace embedding of sorts. Right. Uh, whereas here, this is a higher dimensional version. You need to preserve geometry of the entire subspace up to some one plus minus epsilon distortion, of course. Just a, a technical question. So this is a probability where y is chosen. Uh, uh, no, it's probability over s. Great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So very important uh, to note the quantification. Yeah. It's with high probability over s. Something is good for all y simultaneously. Yeah. So, I, but I don't understand the for all y that belongs to p. But then you say it's for every p. So, ah, why isn't it for every y? Ah, no, no, no good. It's uh, for for every p comes before the probability. So that's what I'm saying. Think of your favorite p. For any fixed p with high probability over s, good things happen for all y's in p. You don't get to choose p after observing s. I guess there's a subtle linguistic difference between for every and for all. Right? So, so, so yeah. So basically, the quantification of p over p is not after. Not after s. Does this help? Uh, no. no. So I still don't understand why it doesn't it mean that it's not for every y. Oh, it's not for every y because if you, how would you establish that it's for every y? One way to do this would be to say, oh, I'll take a union bound over all p's, for instance. But you can't because if you were to do a union bound, this will start multiplying this failure probability. All right. The distribution is a function of p. No, no, great. So the distribution is not a function of yeah, p. Yeah, because the distribution appears before p. Yeah. Yes, yes. The distribution is not a function of p. Uh, and... Uh, we want something to hold for very fixed, uh, for every fixed p. It's the same. What's? Huh? I think people typically say oblivious subspace embedding, right? Yes, this is oblivious. But the complication is that somehow if you put every subspace after this, it's kind of confusing. Mm -hmm. No, no, but uh, the subspace is before the probability, correct? So basically, you fix your favorite subspace. Then you toss the coins to determine S, and S has to work for that subject. So say it's the same thing that we did with the count sketch right now. Yeah, it's I said for every X with high probability over the randomness of count sketch, we will be able to recover something about X. This doesn't mean that there will not exist a different X for which this matrix, this particular choice of count sketch is not going to work. I can try to connect it, do my job connecting the top. So to connect it, I guess, to spectral sparsification, this is asking for a distribution over S, such that then for any subspace P, if we looked at S transpose S restricted to P, it's a spectral sparsifier of the entity or Correct. approximation of the entity. Correct. Just yeah. to make sure I yes. that right. Yes. Maybe let me do a quick example. Yeah. It's relevant to what we do later, but it will be useful. So what's an example of a subspace P? Uh, or rather, let me give you a collection of subspaces P. Mm. So, so what I'm going to do is I'll choose a subset R of coordinates of size D. You know, I'm interested in vectors in Rn. N is way bigger than D. And let me pick my favorite subspace subset R of coordinates, okay? And then I let P sub, I let P sub R, P sub R will be the set of all vectors in Rn. P 
P sub R be the set of all vectors in Rn that are zero except on coordinates in R. It's a coordinate subspace. Then let me instantiate count sketch. Uh, right, so what's the, uh, what's the count sketch matrix? Count sketch, uh, I'll, I'll choose the count sketch matrix as you know, this matrix that takes uh, n-dimensional vectors and squishes them down to, let's say, 100 d squared coordinates. So this will be a matrix with 100 d squared rows and n columns. And every row will be a plus minus one in a random place. Now I claim, um, I claim maybe on this board, <clears throat> I claim that for any fixed R, um, Um, if, uh, unless I messed up my arithmetic. Okay, I said 100 d, d squared rows, so I'll, yeah. So here's what I claim. Uh, I claim that for any fixed R. Can you try to switch to a black R? Yeah, the green and target. Ah, I see. <laughs> Uh, does this comment apply to that board as well? Should I switch that to black as well? Yeah. All right, not, not anymore. In the future. For any fixed R, the following is true. This is what I call <clears throat> for any fixed R. I claim that actually for this particular instance, this is true with epsilon equals zero. I claim that the count sketch matrix on any fixed sub fixed coordinate subspace is an isometry with high constant probability as long as you count sketch into d squared times a constant bucket. Why? Uh, because there are no collisions. By the birthday paradox, uh, right, there will be no collisions. So if you take a vector whose non-zeros live in a fixed set of d coordinates, what does count sketch do? It just well, hashes things into buckets. But with high probability, there will be no collisions between your coordinates. So norms are preserved. On the other hand, once you see the matrix, of course you can find some other R for which this will not work, right? Because, you know, because out of n coordinates, if I hash into d squared buckets, there will be a ton of collisions. So you just pick two and say, all right, here it's not an isometry. Not, not only will it not be an isometry, it will not be a subspace embedding at all. It will simply lose rank. All right. All right. Cool, no, this is actually perfect. Thanks a lot for the question, because what we're going to do, this is a wonderful model for the actual proof. Right. What we will prove is you know, literally that this works not just for any fixed coordinate subspace, but actually the same statement is true for every subspace. And instead of arguing about you know, whether there are collisions between discrete objects, we'll need to argue about Frobenius norm dif distances between matrices. Okay, cool. Are there any other questions? This was wonderful. So I really like to think of. So I really like to. Uh,
Uh, I really like to think of sparse recovery, mm. where you have like a sparse signal, and then you hit it with some matrix, and then you try to recover the signal. So basically, like this is kind of like a perfect RIP matrix from that point of view. Only that you have like large, you you basically, you just like have to pay more, in like the in the sketch signal, right? Uh maybe. Well, yeah, I don't immediately see the yeah. So there's a, so some some sort of a, for each version of RIP. Let's take this offline. Yeah, okay. All right, sounds good. So okay, so we we got the quantifiers right. So that's uh, wonderful. Uh, so let's uh, look at some examples of subspace embeddings. Uh, identity map is a subspace embedding. Doesn't do anything. Preserves uh, norms. If you take S to be a matrix with about d by epsilon squared independent Gaussians, it'll preserve. It'll be a subspace embedding uh, by an epsilon net plus union bound argument. Uh, you can also prove similar properties for a subsample randomized Hadamard transform. Uh, it's non-trivial, but you can. Um, example four is our example count sketch. We're, we're going to prove this now. And there are others. OK. So first, why are, before I prove that count sketch is a subspace embedding, and for which we already have a pretty good model, uh, to be honest, um, why are subspace embeddings useful? So let's just convince ourselves that if S satisfies the subspace embedding property, then instead of solving the big linear uh, least squares regression problem, you might as well solve the small one, and it will not change the quality of fit much. All right. Okay. So let's let's take s. Let's take s to be a d plus one epsilon, a small constant subspace embedding. What's the subspace that we're interested in? Well, what's the least squares regression problem? The act of solving the least squares regression problem is the act of finding a recombination of columns of A that match B best. So all such recombinations live in the column span of the matrix A with a B vector attached to it. So that will be our subspace B. Okay. Now, by the subspace embedding property, for every candidate solution X that you pick, if you look at the Euclidean norm of AX minus B and compare it to the Euclidean norm of SAX minus SB, they're pretty much the same multiplicatively up to some one plus minus epsilon. Good. And, and now we're done. Uh, because suppose that x prime, uh, it should be already clear that this is good, but let's do the sequence of inequalities anyway. Uh, remember, x prime was the minimizer of the reduced least squares regression problem. So the quality, and we're interested in the quality of fit that x prime gives for the big original problem. So this quality of fit is up to some plus minus epsilon loss equal to the quality of fit with that x prime provides for the reduced problem. Now x prime is optimal for the reduced problem. So that's at most what x star, the optimum for the original problem gives for the reduced problem. But that by the subspace embedding property is pretty much the same as the quality of fit that x star gives. Um, for the original problem. Okay, so subspace embeddings are useful. Fantastic. Mm. So now we'll prove uh, the following theorem. This is originally due to Clarkson and Woodruff. Mm. The proof that we'll see is uh, from a paper of uh, Avron, uh, Nguyen, and uh, Woodruff. It's a cleaner proof, much, much simpler. We'll show that count sketch with B buckets is a D epsilon ordered d squared by epsilon squared b subspace embedding. All right, so that's a bit of a um, bit of an expression there. So let me unpack it for you. Now, what do we really want to have in the third parameter? Third parameter is the failure probability. All right, so what we want is the failure probability to be small, let's say smaller than a small constant. So we want d squared over epsilon squared b to be smaller than one over 100, let's say. So this just means that as long as you count, yes. Yeah. 
So we want d squared over epsilon squared b to be at most one over 100, say. So this just means that we should be count sketching into at least d squared by epsilon squared buckets. As long as we do that, so it's basically an extension of what we did here. We know that even if you think of just coordinate subspaces, then you need d squared buckets. There you're either an isometry or not a subspace embedding at all. So there is no epsilon. And uh, here we're saying that uh, for any epsilon, d squared by epsilon squared buckets will suffice. So that's our matrix. It can be applied in N and Z of A time, which is excellent. And uh, it will squish the number of rows in A down to D squared by epsilon squared. Then we get a smaller least squares regression problem. We solve it exactly by standard techniques, classical techniques. OK. So let's prove it. So that's what we. Um, mm -hmm. So we would like to prove the subspace embedding uh, property. Uh, we'll prove it for the column span of A for some notational reasons, because why not? Um, really, the proof goes through for any and P. Uh, let you be an orthonormal basis for our subspace. We Remember, we cared about an orthonormal basis for the column span of A with the vector B attached. I'll just call it the column span of A to simplify things. So that's the corresponding expression. Cool. So we want that with high probability over S, the sketch, the norms of all vectors in our subspace are preserved up to some epsilon loss. Now, all vectors in our subspace uh, can be written as u times y, where y is some vector of coefficients in Rd. Now, it's a d-dimensional subspace. u is its, its basis. So we, all we want is that for all y in Rd, s u y L2 norm squared minus L2 norm of y is at most epsilon times L2 norm of y. I used here that L2 norm of u times y is actually the same as L2 norm of y because u is an orthonormal basis. Uh, very nice. So again, this is the pictorial representation. Our subspace is... A, I've lost track. So uh, for all y in Rd, so where does your subspace... Excellent. Come in. Um, so the subspace, subspace was called P, but now we have an orthonormal basis for it. We call that basis U. So our subspace P is the set of, vector, a set of vectors U times Y, where Y is any vector in RD. As the matrix U, is an n by d matrix with orthonor orthonormal columns. So now, in general, in the subspace embedding property, we want to compare the norm of u times y squared to the norm of s u times y. Right. You take the norm of your vector minus the norm of the sketched version of your vector. But since u is an orthonormal ma matrix, Norm of u times y is actually the norm of y squared. Yeah, perfect. So this is a step that we missed here. And it's great, thanks. Yeah, so that, that's, that's why we have this. Excellent. Yeah. Oh, so a, a picture that goes along with this. Um, aha. All right, so we need to prove that s u y Euclidean norm squared is close to Euclidean norm of y squared. We want to express this as the quadratic form of some matrix. So let's, oh, let's write the Euclidean norm squared as Euclidean norm squared of something is that something transpose itself. 
So Euclidean norm squared of S U Y is the transpose of that times that. Similarly, Euclidean norm of Y is Y transpose Y. Now we can pull out the Y on both sides. And we, are, we realize that this is Y transpose some matrix Y. So it's a quadratic norm of a quadratic form of some matrix at Y. All right, what is that matrix? Let's design some words for it that we can use. Well, basically we have this, what is S times U? U is an orthonormal basis for our subspace. S times U, and, and U is orthonormal if you uh, form the gram matrix of U, U transpose U, you'll get the identity. Now, what we do is we say, all right, we apply the sketch on all the vectors in our orthonormal basis and form the gram matrix again. Right. So this is the gram matrix of the sketched basis minus the gram matrix of the original basis. And, you know, uh, the gram matrix of the original basis was identity, and uh, the hope is that uh, after sketching, it's still close to identity. But now, formally, what we need to prove uh, is that the gram matrix of the sketched basis is close to the identity in spectral norm, because we want that for every y, the quadratic form at, of this matrix at y is at most epsilon times the L2 squared norm of y. So it's an operator norm. It's an operator norm bound. <laughs> Sorry, but I'm just confused. So uh, U transpose U would have been the gra a gram matrix N or a, would have been a D by D gram matrix. Exactly. Uh, after the sketching, we want... It's, it's the same. It's Dimensions still the D by D matrix. Yeah, great point, right? So you see, you, have D, you, you had D vectors, you still have D vectors. It's just that the vectors are a bit distorted. They now live in a lower dimensional space. They were N dimensional, now they're... I see, yeah, okay. Okay, still have to do if I could follow up again, making the yeah. same connection to Sushad's talks, this is asking that U transpose, S transpose SU is a spectral approximation of the identity. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. As yeah. It's a special. The other day. Right. Okay. Um, fantastic. So oh, we want to prove this. Mm. I want to prove that this happens with high constant probability as long as the number of buckets that we hash into is at least D squared by epsilon squared. Um, okay, uh, in Sushant's uh, talk, similar bounds were obtained by uh, applying the matrix Bernstein uh, inequality. Right. So here, it turns out to be more beneficial to sort of go more directly. Uh, why? Uh, because actually a stronger bound holds. Uh, well, instead of proving the operator norm bound, we'll just prove that the same bound holds with high probability for the, in the Frobenius norm. And Frobenius norm of every matrix upper bounds the spectral norm of every matrix, so the result will follow. The Frobenius norm is a simpler beast to work with than a spectral norm. You can start just comparing matrices entry-wise, right. and that will really power the uh, power what we do. Okay, so we'll put the stronger <laughs> bound. We'll show that the uh, with high constant probability the squared Frobenius norm is at most epsilon squared. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what is this about? Uh, now we're comparing um, we're comparing the gram matrix of our basis U, let's say, uh, to the gram matrix of the sketched version of this ba basis. Uh, what is the gram matrix? The gram matrix of D vectors is just a matrix of dot products. Gij is ui transpose uj, all right? Uh, and that's sort of g and g prime that we're interested in is the same thing, but we should be looking at sketched, the dot products between sketched columns of this matrix. Okay, and we're Interested in the Frobenius norm squared of the difference between these two matrices, um, that's just the sum over all the d squared entries of the uh, squared distance in the uh, squared distance uh, difference of the corresponding entry. So we're really just interested in 
in the sum over all i comma j in d of u i transpose u j minus sketched u i count sketched u i transpose count sketched u j squared. So now this is the separates over all coordinates. Just checking my intuition with the norms, the moment we wrote for Benius as the goal, we kind of increased the number of rows we need in the subspace embedding to probably, but like, like we probably now need at least like a D squared or something. Like before that, we maybe had hope, hope of, of something better. But the moment this became the target, like we need something super linear in D probably for, for a subspace embedding to work. Yes, I agree that, um, yeah. Well, I would think about it differently that no, we're trying to prove the spectral bound, uh, but we realize that somehow the tight setting, it, basically, how can the, yeah, we just realize that in the tight setting when the spectral bound, bound fails, the Frobenius bound, bound fails as well, right? So this is the situation in which there isn't really, you know, the tight, in the tight settings, uh, there isn't really a factory deep gap between two. Right? Basically, if, you look at all the eigenvalues, right? You, you basically, you ask yourself. Uh, uh, Sorry, just to phrase another way. Suppose we want we define like subspace embeddings as wanting this Frobenius guarantee. Oh, then, then, yeah. then I'm saying then, that we couldn't have hoped to get like better than much better than d squared. We couldn't have hoped for like d over epsilon squared. Agreed. Like we need to have at least some d to the one plus delta. I agree. Okay. Yes. Yeah. If we were to just commit to Frobenius yeah. straight away, then yes. Good. Uh, okay, so uh, basically now it's clear that what we need to understand is I have two vectors, ui and uj. How is the dot product between them related to the dot product between count sketched versions of the two vectors? And that's what we will understand now. Let me just uh, do the intuition for how they are related, and I think we need to adjourn after that. Uh, good. So, so this entire statement is the statement that hashing with random signs preserves dot product. So let's uh, pick two vectors x and y and rd. We want to prove that count sketched x transpose count sketched y is roughly x transpose y. And here's a pictorial representation of this. Say my vectors here are in dimension eight. So here's x1, x2, x3, da 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 through x8, and y1 through y8. Um, I'm interested in the dot, how the dot product between the two relates to the dot product between the hashed versions. Let's do an example. Just fix a hash function and write out the dot product. Okay, so here's the sketched x for this particular hash function. The, hunch, the hash function is, of course, the same on the left and on the right. It's the same count sketch. So the first entry corresponds to the first bucket. First bucket contains x4. There was no collision there, so it's perfect sine of four times x4. Uh, second bucket, sine of eight times x8. The third bucket has a collision. It has x1 and x6. So it has s1 times x1 plus s6 plus times x6. And similarly for y. Um, fantastic. Now let's write out what the dot product is between x and y. We know that it's x1, y1 plus x2, y2, da, 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 x8, uh, y8. Now what's the dot product between the hashes? Let's, let's do it. We go over all the hash buckets. The first hash bucket contains s4, x4 times s4, y4. So that seems really good. There's no collision here. That's perfect. We just get a term that we wanted. Second bucket is similar, just contains x8, y8. The third bucket has a collision, so we so we get something a little bit funkier. Ideally here, we would like to get x1, y1 plus x6, y6. There's one and six hash there, but we'll get some cross terms. They will be annoying, but we'll deal with them. And the same for the last two buckets. Good. So let's just simplify this. If you look at the first bucket, well, s4 is plus minus one, s4 squared is one, great. Same with s8. Okay, here let's just separate out the terms that we want and the terms that we don't want. So we get x1, y1, x6, y6, plus the cross terms, product of sines times x1, uh, y6, or y1, x6. 
and the same for the blast. All right, so overall, uh, we get in general the following is true. The dot product between count sketch vectors is the actual dot product plus the cross terms that come from uh, coordinates colliding, distinct coordinates colliding in a bucket. Some over all buckets, some over all i comma j distinct, that hash into that bucket, s i j, uh, s i s j, x y, uh, x, uh, x i uh, y j. Uh, it's immediate that it's an unbiased estimator by what we did before, uh, and just take the expectations. Uh, and now we adjourn and we'll do the variance uh, once we get back. Uh, now the plan uh, for the rest is, We'll uh, do, um, we'll analyze count sketch, we'll prove it's a subspace embedding. I will then talk about, um, about the tensorized versions of this, uh, so kernel uh, matrices, and then I will switch to graph sketching. So we'll see how to do connectivity in uh, dynamic streams uh, using, by sketching the edge, ins edge vertex incidence matrix that uh, uh, was a, a huge object of discussion in Sushant's uh, talk. And finally, how to do uh, spectral approximations. Good. Thank you. Questions? I guess you did the D square because it, it, it tensorizes better or, or uh, as opposed to the D over epsilon square? Oh, so say again? I mean, so, so you, you can get better subspace and the dimension, right? Oh, oh, good. So the dimension you do, you can get uh, close, uh, close D to linear, epsilon square. right? Uh, for, but uh, for that, you shouldn't be doing one round of hashing, right? If you want sort of this NNZ of A, uh, application time for your sketch. If you want it very fast. Ah, okay, yeah. So then you should be hashing. The, the best thing we know is just hashing. You hash once, but then you run into birthday paradox style issues. It's possible to alleviate them. Uh, this is called OSNAP by Jelani, uh, Jelani Nelson and uh, Daniel Kane and follow ups with the whole thing. Um, this uh, basically hashes sort of more times and the target dimension gets closer to linear. But here we're analyzing the hash once primitive, and there because of the birthday paradox, those examples, the truth is d squared. Yeah, so uh, apart from the faster mm -hmm. running time, are there uh, uh, sort of sketch? Are there other advantages uh, uh, when you kind of like do the tensor version of this? It's... Oh, oh, oh! I see. The tensor version of this has not really come up. Uh, the way it will come up is uh, the following, if you're then interested in kernel methods, basically think of, you have these data points and then you're not interested in their direct like, linear gram matrix, but you're interested in first constructing some feature embedding and then doing the gram matrix, there we will need tensorized versions. So, so it shouldn't be clear how tensorized versions at this point are not obviously useful. Can you use some of those techniques to solve problem something like you have n by n matrix and you want to do linear regression, but you but you only want your solution to be case sparse? Ah, you want linear regression subject to sparsity constraint. I, I do not know. Okay. Uh, yeah. That's, that's a compressive sensing kind of question. I'm more like lasso. Yeah. You want to penalize L1. It's not clear because you can't preserve L1 norms. Yeah, I think Misha is asking if you uh, asking about you actually have a big matrix. There's a lasso of compressed sensing is you know you have a nice matrix with a few rows like RIP matrix, uh, right? Uh, and then you then you optimize the quality of fit plus an L1 penalty, uh, right? But I, I think Misha is asking. You want linear regression, so you have that a big be, matrix. I thought that would be the formulation, right? You want to find a x minus b, but penalize the sparsity with via the L one norm for x. Oh, oh right, I agree. Yes, right. yes. So I don't think it's a compressive. Oh, right. oh yes, yes, agreed. Right. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know if one can do sketch. Maybe somebody in the audience does. So, so interesting. Yeah. Hi. Um, one related question: Do you know how sparse a uh, matrix S could be? How sparse the matrix S could be? Uh, I know the count sketch seems to be as sparse as it gets, right? For every uh, for every column, there's one non-zero. So if, if it's any sparser than that, uh, then some columns have to be zero, and it's a problem. Uh, 
but uh, could be achievable. Is it such such metrics? Oh yes, yes. Uh, so OSNAP uh, OSNAP uh, lets you do this, right? And uh, if you have more non-zeros per column, then the sketching dimension goes down. So you don't run into birthday paradoxes as much. Oh, all right. Uh, please ask the experts in the audience. <laughs> Oh, good. Uh, so uh, as Moses points out, uh, OSNAP is uh, Jelani and Khoi Nguyen as, as opposed to uh, my previously incorrect uh, uh, citation. So please uh, ask uh, the experts in the audience about everything related to OSNAP. Okay, <laughs> that's the better. Any more questions? All right, let's thank Michael again. <laughs> we have a lunch break now until 2 o'clock, and I'll see you all then. Thank you.